I cook dinner nearly every day, and I do so happily. It can be a relaxing and calculated experience, or if I'm improvising, an intriguing challenge that bears great satisfaction having successfully created a harmony between knowledge, experience, and expectation. If I'm cooking for myself, the satisfaction is lesser, but I have more leeway for mistakes, making it a much more relaxing experience. If I'm cooking for a crowd, then it becomes much more stressful. Tiny mistakes nag, inadequacy sets in. Even after having my guests finish their meals, the desire to do better persists and does not yield to compliments. I can't imagine the stress I would go through if I found myself literally cooking to save my life. The gnaw looks over the quagmire, demanding meal after meal after meal to sate its cravings. Refuse to cooperate, and the gnaw undoes what took millions of years to create man in a matter of seconds. The plague sets deep inside, then binds your lungs into gills before repurposing your spine with a quick breaking of bones into a hunch. With no real communication between myself and the gnaw, I looked to Mumsy for advice as she had been feeding the gnaw for years, ever since she was an adolescent, and her ability to just somehow know what the gnaw is craving is a testament to how much time has passed here. The scales on Mumsy signal her inability to keep up with the gnaw's hunger, allowing for the plague to set in, as well as the empty town which Pipton tells me once had its days of glory until the sick began being lured into the sea. By placing myself into this world, I'd be hard pressed to keep the gnaw fed in a sustainable manner. Mumsy isn't the only one covered in scales, but also the swamp pig king. And then there are Pipton and Sammy who have lost themselves to the disease, with their fading memories being the last to be stolen from them. Constantly tilling the field ruins the quality of the soil. It disrupts the delicate fungal strands, unearths the bacteria, and the soil further below becomes compacted, preventing roots from reaching deep down for water and nutrients. It was a necessary trade-off for the former inhabitants. They needed to mass-produce crops, but it was only able to slow down the plague. Perhaps they only intended to aggressively farm in the beginning while they were searching for a solution that never came. Even if they had discovered a more sustainable method, the salt from nearby ponds would have eroded the topsoil over the years, leaving behind the subsoil containing fewer nutrients, resulting in the necessity for more fertilizer to improve crop yields. The decades of tilling and salinization have damaged the land irreversibly and visibly through the poor color of the dirt. To feed the gnaw, it's best I leave the land alone as much as possible, growing only the bare minimum or risk worsening the soil to infertility. And speaking of infertility, the beefalo have also gone through much more than they can bear. There are only old beefalo, no babies, toddlers, or teens. Despite their age, the beefalo were still working the fields, judging by their yolks. When cattle are overworked, they are unable to conceive. They skip a fertility cycle. Being forced to work day in and day out has stripped them of more than just their wool. I shouldn't grow too many crops, and I can't bring myself to gingerly slaughter any beefalo. I couldn't figure out what would be best to make, but Sammy put me in the right direction. He mentioned a craving for fish, and then I couldn't stop thinking about it either. The salt pond seemed to have plenty of salmon, and although it smelled foul, I was certain it'd be delicious. Out of all the fish recipes I could have gone with, it felt most appropriate to prepare fish pie. As per the recipe, I only needed one vegetable, so long as it's not potato, some flour for the crust, and one salmon. These ingredients would be easy on the land and be enough to sate the gnaw's craving for fish. Although it is called fish pie, the recipe doesn't call for mashed potatoes. Instead, it has a short crust casing made from flour, and there is a fish head which sticks out of the pie, making it more closely resemble stargazy pie. The way the fish head looks upward is what gives it its name. 
Fish pie was just one of the acceptable offerings for the gnaw, and after my escape, I thought it'd be great to make it again. It's very befitting for the world. Stargazy pie originated in Cornwall, England, and the legend goes that a man fed a starving village by braving out to sea during a winter storm, catching seven types of fish. What better dish could be made to better represent the quagmire, or don't starve, than a pie which has saved people from starvation. So the first thing I'm going to do is make the pastry. This is completely optional and if it's easier for you, you can just go ahead and use the pre-made stuff. The taste is, I think, the same. But to stay true to the game, I'm going to try to make this from scratch. Combine 2 cups of flour and 8 ounces of cold cubed unsalted butter to a food processor and pulse for a few seconds to achieve a breadcrumb texture. Add 6 tablespoons of cold water to the processor and pulse very briefly just to incorporate it. Separate the flour into two piles onto your work surface and mold them into a ball with very minimal hand work. Having cold hands will help, so just rinse with cold water and dry them off. Working the ball of dough develops the gluten too much, and warm hands will melt the butter, so just be aware. Flatten the balls of dough into the shape of a disc before wrapping them up with cling wrap. Store them in the fridge for at least 2 hours to rest. Now onto the brine. Make sure to work with a clean head of salmon. It will be much easier to have the butcher remove the gills and clean it for you. Skip this process if it's already done for you, but here I'm just going to show what I've done and I'm not really a professional on this by any means, so I do, again, recommend that you use a butcher. <laughs> Cut the top part of the head and lever your knife downwards to butterfly the skull down to the tongue. With kitchen scissors, break joints inside the head that connects the gills to the cheeks. Remove as much of the guts as you can, including the tongue and the gills. Rinse any blood off. Use scissors or a knife to remove any blood clots. Keep the eyeballs for presentation and they are edible if you're uh, willing. Cut the fillets of salmon into smaller pieces and remove the skin if it's still on. I made the mistake of keeping it on and it was not good. Add them along with the salmon head into an empty container so long as it's not metal. The salt solution for the wet brine I used is 1 tablespoon of sea salt to 1 cup of water. Measure the amount of water you add to the container, which should be just enough to cover all of the fish pieces. Add salt in relation to the amount of water added, and then store it in the refrigerator for an hour. The next few steps I recommend starting about 15 minutes before the short crust pastry and the brine are ready. Boil the turnips and carrots in a pot of water until they're tender. They are ready when a fork can pierce through them without any resistance. Be mindful of the carrot cooking faster than the turnip. Drain the pot and dry it with a paper towel before adding the turnips and carrots back in. Peel the skin off of the turnips at this stage. This is done now instead of before boiling so that the skin helps mitigate the amount of water the turnip absorbs. Mash the vegetables and add butter and milk. Add just enough milk to achieve a fluffy texture. Use a hand blender to break down the chunks further for a creamier texture. Add salt and pepper and then set it aside. Remove the dough from the fridge and remove the cling wrap and let it come to room temperature for just a couple minutes, but this will ultimately depend on how warm or humid your home is. Flour your work surface, the rolling pin, and the first dough generously before carefully rolling them out wide enough to fill the inside of the pie tin. Once it is stretched out enough, roll the rolling pin from the bottom of the dough upwards, moving slowly. The dough should loosely roll along with the rolling pin all the way through. Then carefully roll the dough over the pie tin to set it inside. Fill the spaces in and pinch off any excess dough. With a fork, pierce the bottom of the pie shell a few times. Use either oven safe plastic wrap, and it must be specifically stated by the manufacturer, or parchment paper to place it on top of the pie shell. Pour baking rice or beans or the parchment paper to act as a weight to further keep the pie shell down as you blind bake it. Bake the pie shell at about 350 Fahrenheit or 177 Celsius for 15 minutes. 
Take the pie out of the oven and remove the parchment paper along with the beans or rice that you used. Add the mashed carrot and turn the mixture evenly into the pie shell. Drain the brine and pat dry the pieces of salmon and head with a paper towel. Place the salmon fillets into the pie and then I decided to add some fresh dill. Uh, it's, it was, it's not in the game but I figured it would go well with the salmon. Pour heavy cream into the pie. I added just enough to nearly reach the surface. Roll out the second dough just as before and roll it over the top of the pie shell. Cut a hole on the edge of the pie big enough for the salmon head to fit through. Prop the salmon head near the edge of the pie. Since the head was butterfly, spread the flap ends open just enough to act as a support. If you also have a salmon tail, add it to the other end of the pie. Use leftover dough to fill in the spaces around the salmon head so that the pie casing is covered completely. Bake the fish pie in the oven at 370 Fahrenheit or 188 Celsius for about 15 to 20 minutes. Broil the pie afterwards until it reaches a golden color, but keep an eye on it uh, just as I did in the game and you, I could argue for authenticity, I, I kind of let it burn. Well, honestly, I mean, because I left the skin on, it was not as enjoyable as it could have been, but the flavor was pretty decent. I did eat most of the pie, so I don't think I'll be making it again anytime soon. And I'm sure it could be much better tasting if you were to use other ingredients. But again, I just wanted to kind of keep this as like, I wanted to keep this as true to the game as possible. 